One second. Okay, I think that we are now live. Let me just double check and make sure. Okay, perfect. Okay, well, thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you everyone who um, may be watching live on our Facebook right now. Um, Today's conversation um, is going to address the hidden yet the pervasive occurrence of sexual assault within the Black and African American community um, and how it can unfortunately become normalized within the family structure. So this is our third webinar in the series and we are so excited today to um, have our guest speaker, Charmaine Respis here to share her story with us, as well as Cassandra Berry, our wonderful community educator at Denton County Friends of the Family, and also the leader of our Our Community Matters program. So thank you both so much for being here. Um, and I'm gonna kick it over to you, Cassandra. Okay, well, thank you, Katie. And thank you to everyone who is tuned in uh, to be a part of this important discussion. I'm happy to have with us today um, Charmaine Respis, um, who is a co-founder and executive director of Antioch Christian Fellowship Church in Corinth, Texas. And I will tell you a little bit more about um, her background just prior to her sharing with us her own personal experience. Um, as the program stated, we're um, closing out this uh, mm -hmm. month of sexual assault awareness by bringing attention to and having a conversation about sexual assault and abuse in the Black African American community. I titled the program as I did, Secrets in My Hood, um, because of the pervasive silence around talking about the occurrence of sexual abuse, especially when perpetrators um, is a family member, a friend, or even someone who's considered to be a respected leader within the African American community. What we know about sexual abuse um, is that it's one of the most underreported violent crimes according to the Department of Justice. And that's regardless of the victim's um, sex, age, race, ethnicity, religion, or socioeconomic class. But as a group, African-Americans are the least likely to break the silence. There has been considerable research um, on the topic of sexual abuse of African-Americans and to include um, one that was done by a Dr. Jennifer Gomez, who's an assistant professor at Wayne State University. Um, in one of her articles, she raises the question, as the founder of the Me Too movement, um, who is Tarana Burke, who is a black woman, not getting death threats from black men. The underlying core of these questions is what really makes trauma traumatic? Um, decades of uh, research on trauma of physical or uh, sexual um, psychological violence have shown the same thing. Victimization hurts people. It's just a fact. Victimization hurts people. Sexual assault in particular can be painful to all who experience it. However, as a trauma expert has, who has studied the effect of violence for over a decade, um, Dr. Gomez found that there is a unique harm for black people and other minorities who, whose perpetrators are of the same minority group. And so to understand this harm, Dr. Gomez created what's called a cultural betrayal trauma theory. And the general idea of that is that the cultural betrayal trauma theory is that some minorities develop what she's calling intracultural trust, that is love, loyalty, attachment, connection, responsibility, and even solidarity with each other to protect themselves or ourselves from an outside hostile society. And within that group violence, um, such as a black perpetrator harming a black victim um, is a violation of this intercultural trust. And so, and so this violation is considered like a cultural betrayal betrayal is such that um, there's a belief that you know we don't air our dirty laundry what happens within the home especially the home of african americans in the community stays within that home and community and there's like a mandate not to betray um, the race and that intercultural um, pressure 
it somewhat punishes people who speak out about that cultural betrayal that they have gone through and endured. And what her research further showed that within the group um, nature of trauma, it includes betrayal um, in minorities that affects mental health. And we're gonna talk about that when Charmaine shares her story, the impact of mental health um, as it relates to um, sexual trauma and sexual um, abuse. An observation that I made in doing this research that, you know, had been overlooked actually on my part um, is how um, having a member of the family who was a sexual predator, um, unfortunately has become somewhat tragically um, normalized. You know, that is family members are aware of these sexual atrocities by that uncle or by that cousin or brother or you know, even an auntie, because we don't discount the fact that men and boys are sexually abused as well. Um, that has become like the elephant in the middle of the family reunion that no one chooses to address. And so to some extent, it has become something so normalized that at times it's even joked about. Um, in doing the research and thinking about a um, comedy show that was done by Chris Rock, um, I was reminded of um, within that comedy show that he makes reference to the sexual atrocity. So we're gonna take a moment and look at that if you will get that ready, Katie. And um, we'll discuss that a little bit and then we'll go on to you to be able to hear from Charmaine. We don't have volume, Katie. Are you able to hear it? Hold on, let me. And what I talk about my gay uncle, see your uncles prepare you for life. You got enough uncles that prepare you for life because your uncles, you got every type of uncle. You got your gay uncle. <laughs> you got your alcoholic uncle. You got your stealing uncle. You got your molester uncle. Everybody got that one molester uncle. And you know, your mama's like, where them kids at? <laughs> they were trying to get them kids. Get them kids. Hurry up. Get them kids. Don't you leave them with your Uncle Johnny. Don't you leave them with your Uncle Johnny. And it, it goes on to say also within that clip, how um, one of the matriarchs in the family is asking about the whereabouts of one of the young girls and the young girl comes to her and um, you know says Uncle Johnny was inappropriate with her. And then she gets blamed for being, um, as a mother would put in the wrong place at the wrong time saying, I've warned you about Uncle Johnny. Um, you shouldn't have been along with him. So you just gonna need to walk it off. And so the, the, the sadness in this is that that, um, that little bit right there generates a lot of laughter. And I don't know if it's laughter because people think it's funny or they laughing because um, they know that that exists within their family or if it's just a nervous form of laughter um, because they're at a comedy show. But what we know about trauma, what we know about sexual abuse is that it is not something um, to be laughed at or made fun of, but because of it becoming so normalized and um, using the, the script from um, Chris Rock, you know, that Uncle Johnny is a member of the family. So the way to handle that is not to um, call out Uncle Johnny, but to warn the kids to stay away from Uncle Johnny. And so that is an unfortunate occurrence that probably happens in a lot of families um, otherwise, the, the amount of laughter and familiarity with that would not have been generated from that, from that um, script within his comedy show. Um, so because it's not a laughing matter, we want to talk about, you know, what are some of the realities? What can we glean from um, raising awareness? What do we know about someone who has um, been a victim and who was a survivor 
and who has become empowered to share her story. So again, um, thank you, Sister Charmaine Respus, for being with us today. Thank you. Um, let me tell you a little bit about Sister Charmaine. Before I do, I want to give recognition to Tony. Tony, wave at the people. Tony Johnson um, Simpson is our executive director, so thank you for joining in. But we're going to hear the story from Sister Charmaine, and then we're going to um, just enter into a Q&A. And if there are questions that you have, I've already received a couple um, after we are done, then we want to be able to answer as many of those as possible. Um, Charmaine Respus is a lover of old sitcoms, especially Sanford and Son. However, given the opportunity to speak and share her story about overcoming trials, depression, and more, she eagerly seizes it. I had the opportunity to hear her story three years ago and was so uh, moved by her story and was so um, um, just um, appreciative of her courage and um, the way in which she shared and gave strength to those who were in the room that um, I told her, I said, I, I want you to be able to share this. And so the opportunity came about and we thought that COVID-19 would prevent this, but um, thank goodness for technology and we we're able to still present this. Charmaine holds a Master of Arts in Theological Studies from Liberty University and a Bachelor's of Science in Business Management and Ethics. She always considers it an honor to share her story of hope and encouragement. And hope is one of the things that we promote through our mission statement to the clients that we serve. She um, shares that in a way to as many that will listen. Um, Charmaine has spoken to youth to include boys and girls, um, at-risk girls, and women around the DFW Metroplex and in and throughout the Denton Independent School District and her topic has been about not only um, awareness around sexual assault, but mental health awareness. And she'll talk about the intersection of that um, when she shares her story. She's facilitated and hosted workshops on mental illness and suicide prevention, and has been a guest panelist for teens and adults who struggle with mental illness and suicide. She's a co-founder and executive director, as I mentioned up front, of the Antioch Christian Fellowship Church in Corinth, Texas. Her favorite scripture is Philippians 4, 8, and 9. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. She's married to Christopher J. Respis, who is the lead pastor of Antioch Christian Fellowship Church. And they have three beautiful adult children, Amber, CJ, and Lauren. And I want to add before um, Charmaine presents her stories that there may be some things that she shares that creates triggers for any of you who are listening. So please feel free to call our um, office at 940-387-5131. Or you can call and you can even now text to our crisis hotline and that number is 940-382-7273. And those numbers will be given at the end. And know that we respect um, the stories um, of people that we invite to share. And while we are not a faith-based um, agency, um, we appreciate and respect the fact that a lot of what um, Charmaine will um, share about her own personal experience is faith-based and know that um, you have the option to believe or deny whatever she says about her faith or, or according to her healing, but we don't discount and try to remove any portion of the story that a person feels is important to um, them sharing. And so without further ado, let's now turn it over to Charmaine. Thank you for, again for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Didn't County friends of the family, Cassandra Berry and Tony Simpson uh, Johnson for this opportunity to speak about uh, sexual assault and a little bit about depression. It is an honor and I'm truly humbled for this opportunity and I do not take this topic lightly. And as uh, you shared in my bio, um, it is a story that is personal and um, um, and triggers. So if I shed a tear, I apologize because although 
I have uh, overcome and I'm healing and I'm coping um, is still something that's very sensitive to me. Um, so I thank you uh, for this opportunity, this platform. Um, as the video, as Chris Rock shared in the video, we all have that Uncle Johnny or a cousin that we are aware of. And uh, unfortunately, we don't share and we don't bring about um, the challenges and the sexual assault and abuse that has taken place um, over the years or in our you know, you know, past experiences. And so this opportunity uh, allows me to share some light personally on, um, about my experience and how I coped and how I dealt with it. And it started out when I was about six um, to eight years old. I was uh, um, about six or seven. And it was during a playtime period where family was over. Uh, family was over at the house gathering as um, most families do um, on a Sunday. And, um, but we were gathering and um, what happened, you know, all the kids were um, in the back room. And then what happens is that I had a, an extended relative that wanted to have playtime, so to speak, um, with me. And being such a young person, I didn't know what that meant. And so um, with that, um, he wanted to have playtime. And during that playtime, that's where I was sexually assaulted. And not knowing what that meant and how to process that, it was something that I kept um, for years. And I'm now 48. And so for over 40 years, it was something that I kept for a very long time. And um, this person um, was a probably a teenager. My you know, cousin was a teenager. So um, if he understood it, I'm not sure. But during this time that I experienced it, it was very devastating. But at the same time, I did not clearly know what happened. I, but I did know something was inappropriate and it was not right. And so with that being said, I didn't share with anyone. I kept it a secret. I kept it a secret, as your title says, secrets in the hood. I kept it a secret for many years. But what happened over the years, my coping of what happened began to manifest itself on the outside. And that was through not only anger, fists of rage, fighting, lack of trust, and just complete hatred for men. And um, throughout this, um, throughout my years, I lost my father. He was killed in a tragic car accident. So not only had I been sexually assaulted, I lost my father in a tragic car accident. So all of these things that happened only just made things worse for me. And um, because I was in denial, um, because I was angry, because I was bitter, um, how I began to act with my family, how I began to act with uh, my peers, how I began to act with um, adults, uh, became something that was um, unmanageable. And as a result, um, It didn't go well for me. Um, I apologize. Um, the bitterness, the anger, the resentment, the rage was ignored by my family. They didn't know what was going on. And I was too ashamed to share, to share with them because I was this perfect little girl, so I thought, and to destroy that and to share that would not only hurt me, hurt my family, but hurt the individual. And so I just coped um, in a very negative way. And it began to express itself in fighting um, with other people in that school. I got into fights at school um, and no one knew. No one knew what was wrong. And they all contributed to uh, my father being killed in a car accident. However, they didn't know the secret that I was holding and I held it for years. And over time, as I uh, began to uh, really become angry and bitter, it got worse where it kind of, it transitioned into depression where I attempted suicide on many occasions. And I was placed in a state hospital on a couple of occasions and yet no one ever asked, no one ever asked what happened and what is really going on. And because I was suppressing it, 
and I was bitter and angry. I wanted my family to know what was going on and I wanted them to say, this is what's going on, but they never did. So I just played this perfect little girl. I had this facade on. I went on to be, you know, be participative in sports and pretend like nothing happened. But as I began to um, date men and be in relationships, um, they always failed. There was always in the back of my mind, no man can be trusted. Um, that I hated men, but yet I was longing for a relationship. I was longing for something that was truly sincere, real, but I didn't understand how that would work because I was violated at such a young age. And as a result, the relationships were in and out. They were inconsistent. And I never understood what true love really was. And the coping um, really led to my depression um, because I didn't cope with it well. I didn't have the proper tools to cope with the, the sexual assault. I didn't have um, someone in my corner to share with me this is how you manage um, the abuse that took place, the assault that took place. This is how you manage depression. And it just manifested itself where every relationship that I had failed and failed because I was like a fighting. I was being abusive toward the man and they didn't understand and neither did I. And it wasn't until I um, actually um, eventually got to a point where I said, something is wrong. I can't continue like this. I can't continue my life in, in anger and uh, having fits of rage and uh, not trusting men or fighting men. And um, it wasn't until I actually got married to my husband, uh, Chris Respis, where he saw something in me that wasn't right. And he said, Charmaine, you cannot continue to live your life. At some point, you have to break down the barriers of not trusting men and become vulnerable to trusting who I am. And once he said that, I began to ask myself, you know, what is it that I'm so angry about that makes me not trust men, that makes me not um, believe that they are, um, or any good. And, and it wasn't until I actually found me one day, literally in the shower, you know, in a fetal position, that he said, you need to get help. And that you need to address whatever's happened in your past. If you don't address it, it's going to get worse. And you're going to begin to push people away from you that love you. As a result of doing that, I sought help and uh, began to acknowledge what happened because I was at the time a pastor's wife. And once I became a pastor's wife, of course, as a pastor's wife, you try to keep up this facade. You know, I have to be perfect. And it wasn't until I said, I can't do this anymore. I have to, you know, stop suppressing what is going on in order for me to be healed. And it wasn't until that point that I said, okay, I want to be healthy, not only for myself, I wanna be healthy for my family and I wanna be healthy for the church. And, uh, and that course took years. It, it took a lot of years and it's something that I still struggle with today, but it's something that I've learned over time, not only learning to forgive, uh, forgive my cousin for what happened and understanding, not making excuses for what he did, but understanding where he was and forgiving him. It doesn't mean I forgot, it simply means I forgave him in order for me to move forward and have peace of mind. And so um, and here I am today. Um, it's still a sensitive subject. I, I'm here crying, but it was something that needed to take place in order for me to be healed and uh, to have a healthy relationship with a man. So, um, so that's my story. That's my story in a nutshell. And, uh, and I know I don't minimize my story, nor do I minimize anyone else's story, for we all have a different story, but the same nonetheless. And I, this is an opportunity for me to just really share my heart in, in what I experienced and how I was able to move forward. 
Well, first, let me say thank you for your courage. Thank you for being willing to share your story. Thank you for the first time that I heard your story now about three years ago that has stuck with me even till today, knowing that um, by you being empowered that you are now in a position to empower others who have gone through similar occurrences. Um, what I find interesting, uh, and I know that others can probably speak to the same thing is that how at an early age, um, we take on such the responsibility of protecting our family. You know, you made reference to things that I have felt, you know, growing up, especially within the church and in the community, having to present ourselves as that good, perfect little girl. And so anything that would blemish that even to no fault of our own, we carry the responsibility for holding on to that and holding on to that image. So tell us a little bit more about that and um, you know, how, that, how that felt. And um, then you would share with what we talked about how as an adult, you um, shared this with your, with your family and how um, you know, the response that you got was the interactions with your cousin would have been different. And so it was to me, the way in which you shared that, um, a, um, an opportunity to yet validate that you were not at fault and that you would not have been seen differently than the innocent little girl that you were. So tell us a little bit more about that. If I may, there were several questions in there, um, <laughs> but uh, initially um, my background, um, you know, I have, uh, have uh, two siblings and how we grew up um, was a little different. I, my mom had me at a, a young age. However, um, the dynamics of being a blended family, I was, um, put on a pedestal. I will say that I was put on a pedestal. And as a result of being put on a pedestal, I had to maintain, so I thought this perfect life, this perfect image that Charmaine, um, that I thought was necessary in order to not only protect myself, but uh, protect the image that I thought was so necessary. And so throughout my childhood life on into middle school, at the time, junior high and high school, I was maintaining this image that I was this perfect little girl, yet crying on the inside and hurting on the inside. And that facade lasted, you know, through my adult life up until I got married. It was a facade that I had to maintain that I thought was necessary so that no one would truly know what I experienced. Because if they knew what I experienced, then I would be ashamed, I would be embarrassed, and they wouldn't look at me the same way. And so they would, that perfect image would be shattered. And so, um, but what happened over the years because of my inability to, to process what happened and the attempts of suicide as a, you know, as a teenager and as a young adult, I got called. I got called crazy. I got called a lunatic. I got called all the negative words that you would hear back in the, in the eighties. And, um, and so um, it was something that I did not want that to happen, but it began to happen because I was unable to um, seek help and also understand what was really happening. And so, um, and of course at that time, we didn't have the resources uh, and the information that we have today about mental health and about sexual assault. And as you mentioned, we, we swept it under the, uh, underneath the covers, underneath the carpet, and we didn't say anything because we didn't want to ruin the reputation of a family member. And we, I was a child, so who would believe a child over someone who's older than you? You know, who's going to take your word and actually believe? Is it made up in your mind? Is it a lie? I don't have proof. What evidence do you have? Those are questions that people ask and that, you know, I often, you know, ask myself. And so therefore I have to maintain this image. And so that's what I thought. I swept it underneath the carpet and I left it there. And so, but yet the manifestation of what I had experienced was now being um, demonstrated, you know, um, through my actions, you know, the, as I mentioned earlier, the fighting, the fits of rage, the attempts of suicide, and no one ever asked. And that just continued on into my adult life. 
And, uh, and because I was unable to maintain a healthy relationship with any one man, um, it never really uh, was resolved. It was never really dealt with because the relationships were temporary. And so it wasn't until I got married where now this is something that is permanent. This is a relationship where I just can't leave. You know, I can't just say I'm out or he can't say he's out, although he probably could have. Um, but he was the first person that said, I'm here to stay, but we need to deal with the issue. And it wasn't until then that I realized I can't continue running or pretending like I have, I'm this perfect person. And he was the person that said, I need you to look in the mirror, acknowledge what happened and begin to deal with um, the, the, the past, the, the, the repercussions, the results, the consequences um, in order to be healthy. And so, and it was a hard look in the mirror because now I have to look at myself, look at what happened and, um, and not allow what that defining moment to define who I am today and what I was becoming. And so because of that, I had to acknowledge and it was a defining moment where in discussions with my husband and him finding me in a fetal position um, in the shower one day and then one day at church where I, pastor's wife, you know, first lady, um, that I was at a point, a breaking point where I said, I can't deal with this facade anymore. And I can't because I am just, you know, dying on the inside because I can't be Charmaine. And I'm tired of being first lady Charmaine. I want to be Charmaine. And I need to tell my truth. I need to tell my story. And it was one Sunday during um, invitation, the end of service, where I just stood up and went to the front of the church. Of course, my husband had no idea what I was gonna share. And I just said, this is what happened. This is what happened to me as a child. This is who I am. I've struggled with depression. I've attempted suicide. I have scars to this very day that remind me of my attempts. And yet this is who I am because in the inside, I was feeling like I was enslaved. I was in bondage to my past and I need to move forward. However, in order to move forward, I had to let go. And what I thought for so many years was that my past was defining who I was today, who I am today. And finally I said, I don't care what people think of me because I cared all my life. And I finally got to a point where I didn't care what people thought of me and but I need to share that for me in order to let it go and so as a result uh, people received it well and it was literally a burden lifted off of my shoulder because now I felt like I was completely free from having held that secret in for so long uh, and it's kind of like when you have something that you want to share but you can't share until the right time and it's just bursting you know at the at the seams and finally I said, here you are, this is what it is. And this is what happened. And, um, and, and, and after that, it was, it was a relief and um, it wasn't a applause of yay, you know, but it was a relief for me because I finally released something that I've been holding on to for years. And um, it's been a process throughout the years. I've learned to acknowledge what happened but not allow it to define who I am. And I think for me, I allowed it to define who I am or who I was at the time for so many years. And I couldn't move forward in life. I was afraid to do anything it, because in the back of my mind is, what if they found out, you know, what if they found out this happened? What would they think of you? And it wasn't until um, I said, I didn't care. And um, it was about maybe I would say maybe 10 years ago or so when I finally told my mom, I finally told my mom, she did not know, had no clue of what happened. And when I shared it with her, she was in complete shock, um, completely surprised, had no idea whatsoever what had happened. Um, she was angry. And even last week or so, when I mentioned it to her again, she said, well, how come you didn't tell me? And I said, I didn't know, I was afraid to. And uh, her response was, you know, had you told me then, 
the outcome would have been different. And, uh, but I had to remind her that I was at peace and that I was not here to seek revenge. I was not here to destroy anyone. I was simply here to, to let her know what happened. And unfortunately for the person, um, his life turned out differently. It turned out differently. And, um, but, I, 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 um, but I had to share that with her so that she would know and be aware of what happened, not to uh, have her be angry, um, but it was just to let her know this is what happened. And so, um, however, even as uh, Chris Rock mentioned in his video about the Uncle Johnny, um, when I would visit, uh, visit home and visit family, um, I gave my mom clear instructions. Whatever you do, do not take my children around them in this person. Do not leave them alone. And at all times, you are to remain with my children. Otherwise, they will not come and visit. And so, and most times I was there with them, but during the summers when they were much younger and they would visit, those were clear instructions. Do not leave my children around this individual. And so, and, uh, and she understood that and she respected that. And I never had an issue with that. And so, um, but that was how I, you know, responded um, uh, with now protecting my children from what happened to me and speaking up. And so, um, so yes, ma'am. Well, what was that um, light bulb experience for you when um, you saw the relationship, the intersection of um, your being clinical diagnosis, depressed and um, suffering from depression and that linking to that experience as a child. Can you repeat, um, repeat the first half again? I'm sorry. Tell me more about how enlightened you became um, when you realized that there was a correlation between what happened and then the, your anger, your resentment toward men, your um, being clinically diagnosed with depression. Um, how enlightening was for you to look back and say, um, again, you were not at fault. You were still that good little girl and that that trauma um, subsequently had an impact on your actions and that the labels that you were given, you know, crazy lunatic were not accurate labels because of what you knew about what had happened to you? Um, I was very enlightened. Uh, it helped me, you know, put together the, the, the pieces of the puzzle. And uh, it's always, as you're putting together a, a puzzle and you always have that missing piece and you're trying to figure out where is that piece in order to complete this puzzle. And so I was very enlightened. And then it's kind of like the aha moment um, that we have, that we finally find an answer to the problem that we've had for so long. And so for me, it was that aha moment, you know, where I finally had that piece that said, this is why, you know, I struggle with depression. This is why uh, I am who I am. And so, and what happened over time and as I uh, continue to learn more about depression um, is learning not only the triggers and, um, you know, those things, those factors that contribute to the depression, but it helped me begin to recognize and acknowledge uh, my past experience, but not allow it to define who I am today. But it was very enlightening because now I had that final piece um, to the puzzle to say, okay, these are the dots that are now connected. This is the piece that is now completing a puzzle that I can understand who I am today and why my mind operates the way that it does. And, and as a result, um, be able to take steps forward and progress um, with dealing with my depression. Um, but it was very, I mean, it was very enlightening because you go for so long asking yourself why, 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 and now have the answer to that why. And, but from there, it's what are you gonna do with that information? What are you gonna do once you, you have that final piece of the puzzle, when you have that answer to that why, what steps are you gonna take forward? And, and that's where we, we get stuck or that's where I got stuck. Um, but once I had that piece um, to the puzzle, uh, it was now taking steps forward to what are you gonna do to heal yourself? What steps are you gonna take in order to become whole? Um, because I felt like I was peace here, or peace there, but now what are you gonna do to complete that puzzle and be whole again and move forward? 
And so for me, it was now acknowledging what happened and then, uh, you know, reminding myself that what happened does not define who I am. It doesn't say that I am a failure. It doesn't say that I'm worthless. It doesn't say that um, I'm unlovable. It doesn't say that no one wants me. It doesn't say any of those things. Um, what it says is that it happened for me. It happened. What am I going to do to move forward? Am I going to stay here in the past? and keep allow it to keep me paralyzed or am I going to take steps to move forward and I had to eventually of course it took years but I had to eventually say I need to take steps to go forward and, and not stay stuck there because if I remained there I would have continued to be angry bitter um, and just hating men and so I had to take steps forward and, and not allow it to keep me paralyzed so, um, so yes, ma'am. So that was that enlightening moment for me and, and then going forward from there. Awesome. Uh, before I move on to other questions, Tony, I see you shaking your head. Were there any questions or comments you wanted to make? I just wanna thank Charmaine really for sharing. It's always so courageous when we as women come forward to tell our story and we do it so many times in order it's part of our healing but also knowing that it helps and it echoes with so many other women who are out there who've had the same experiences or young girls who are going to yet have those experiences mm -hmm. i think particularly when we speak about secrets in the hood the impact of this particular topic on the black community and black women um you know it's one of the things that you talked about for clearly we know a lot about now in research is that trauma on children and how it impacts their brains and how it reshapes us and how it starts to make changes in our personality and moving forward. We know a lot about the research on that now about childhood trauma that we didn't know maybe 20 years ago or 30, 40 years ago, right? But also even bigger than that, it's so many times as women or as survivors, we carry the shame of abuse or of actions that were not ours. Exactly. You know, it was his shame to carry, but we take it on and carry it so many times and not knowing um, that it's not about us, that it was, we were someone, we survived it, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, if anything, it is, that's the story to be told, but it is very difficult when you're six years old, eight years old, 20 years old, 40 years old, to even know that it's okay to say that that is his shame to carry, not mine, not my burden. And I think when we talk about, particularly in the African-American community, so many times in, in media, Black women may be portrayed as angry, mad. We know now that the correlation of sexual assault and domestic violence in the African-American community, on Black women in particular, is much higher than it is with our white counterpart sisters. Mm -hmm. And there is this image that gets portrayed of black women so many times, but not recognizing that a lot of that may be that she was definitely had, may have been harmed or hurt or a victim of sexual assault as a child that she experienced trauma. And we go along regardless of what background you come from in life and we, accept, we attach labels to people. Mm -hmm. We talk about them being angry. We talk about them having a bad attitude. We talk about depression or suicidal or she's, she uses substances. We, we talk about all these things. She's not a good parent. We do all these things, but we don't oftentimes look for the why behind the why. Exactly. And sometimes as survivors, we don't know the why behind the why either. It takes doing the work. And I think that's one of the things that's so um, enlightening about, Charmaine, about you sharing your stories because you're saying like, I had all these things that happen, but you decided to dig deep and to do the work and to understand why. Because so many times it's when we get lost in it and we don't ever go and figure out and really identify why we're having all these behaviors, all of these things that are happening and subsequently we have all these labels attached to us. Yeah. It's so easy to put people into a label. We see so many clients who they get diagnosed with depression or she's suicidal or she's using substance abuse. And then people put that label on her, but nobody ever wants to dig deep to figure out the why, to go back and heal that childhood trauma. And then that doesn't, the trauma does not get to rule 
who the woman is becomes today. You know, that doesn't get to rob you of the woman and the beauty and all your glory that you sit in now because you took control of it. So I just thank you for sharing your story with all of us and with all the people today because I recognize what a impact it makes on other people to hear. I think particularly we as brown women, black and brown women, we can stand up and say these things and talk about the honesty of it all and to share with other women that we remove some of the stigma and say, it's not your fault. Absolutely. You know, it is never her fault. She's a kid. She's a younger woman. Whatever it is, it was someone else's burden and shame to carry and not the person who was victimized. So I thank you. Going back to those labels, um, I appreciated a post that um, Constance Pullum made um, a couple of weeks or so ago where she posted the question, and this was directed to the faith-based community. Um, why are you so quick to label the little girl as fast or um, womanish, as, as we would say, without knowing that there may be a story behind her actions or why is, why is that, um, why is she carrying that blemish? Like you were saying, Charmaine, you didn't wanna be seen less than the, the perfect little girl. And so is this child acting out as a result of any trauma that she's experienced by someone um, within her family? And so that um, ended up with us having a conversation and um, she posted, um, I would call it an advertisement for today's discussion that really hit home um, a lot of the points that you made. But I wanna address some of the questions that we were getting from the audience to include a couple that Constance um, text me. And one of them um, is, you know, how can we support individuals, especially children and teens, with coming forth once sexual assault has happened? Especially as it relates to, like you said, you know, um, as Tony has said, it's not our shame, but the shame of the person who has um, who has violated us. So, what would you what would you recommend? How have you um, used your empowerment to share? Um, you know, with your children and, and letting them know to feel free to come forth and tell their story and your parishioners as well. Um, thank you. Um, I think for me, um, I think it's to ha open, have a, a conversation or a dialogue or make it where your child feels comfortable in talking to you about what has happened. The subject matter, um, the abuse that has happened is traumatic enough for um, a child. And so they don't know if, if um, you share, if they will believe you. Um, and every scenario is different, but they don't know if sharing this information will harm someone else, if whether or not they will be believed. Um, and just a fear that they may have of, this is what happened to me and it wasn't good. And will you still love me after I tell you? And so for my kids, um, the conversation started early because of what happened to me. The conversation started early in talking about sexual assault, talking about sexual abuse and making them feel comfortable enough to come to me to talk about anything as it relates to um, sexual abuse um, or even depression. But it was um, creating an environment where they feel comfortable enough, comfortable enough to talk to me or their dad about anything that they thought was inappropriate um, against them. And so I think the first step is to create an environment where they feel comfortable in sharing, letting them know that whatever has happened, that they would not be judged um, and that they would not be held accountable if that was committed against them and that they would not be at fault. And I think sometimes um, they may feel like they're at fault or they put themselves in situations where the abuse happened. And to remind them that no matter what happened or no matter what situation or what environment, you are not at fault and you're not responsible. And, uh, and sometimes it's difficult, you know, to get that point across to uh, young children, but to remind them because you don't know what's been said to them. You don't know what's been told. Um, when we hear stories of uh, young children being harmed or being abused, you know, the attacker may, you know, threaten them or threaten the lives of family members or shame them into thinking that if it's exposed about the, the person's behavior, that um, that person, the individual that was attacked or abused, will somehow be at fault. 
And it's to remind them that no matter what has happened, they are not at fault. And that's something I had to remind my children uh, repeatedly that if anything should ever happen, they are not at fault for what happened. And to begin to take those steps for healing. And, um, and you know, for me, it is, as I mentioned earlier, it's taking years. It's not just taking a step, the first step of acknowledging what happened, is now getting help. And so it's, it's not enough. It's that step one, you got to take the step two and step three in order to get to the, the, to the end result that you're wanting and that you desire. And so, um, you know, to, to the, the lady's question is to, again, create an environment where uh, that person feels comfortable in, in sharing openly about what has happened and reminding them that no matter what has happened, their love for them does not change. It does not change whatever. And sometimes I think our children um, or even young adults may think that 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 happens. So, so how, how would you or what would you recommend as far as um, the faith-based communities? The question came up about, you know, what are the faith-based communities doing? What are the churches, churches doing when um, information is given to, to them to share about um, the facts around domestic violence and sexual assault? Um, what responsibility do they have to their members to um, create and heighten this awareness? I mean, it's not one of those Sunday morning sermons that you go in expecting to hear, but it's a everyday reality that what we know, you know, we say in the faith-based world, um, we perish from the lack of knowledge. Well, if we are not sharing this within that setting, one that's considered to be trusted, are we not allowing our people to possibly perish from that lack of knowledge if we don't share? So what would you say as a, as a, um, a, a leader within the faith-based community, what are some of the things that you, that I know you all, we've been to your church and we've shared information. So what are some of the things that you would um, encourage other faith-based communities to do? What I would do, um, or one of the things, as you mentioned, that our church had a um, a session, we had a workshop where we talked about sexual assault, um, is bringing awareness, is bringing awareness to the church and to its members and to its leadership about the issue and no longer sweeping it under the carpet. I think we are afraid of how people will respond or even react to the stories um, that are being shared about abuse. But I think it's bringing awareness. It's not just a one-time workshop that you have once a year or in the month of April for Sexual Abuse Awareness Month, but it's talking about it over time and repeatedly where we begin to break the stigma of keeping it quiet and having you know, secrets in our hood not ever being brought to the forefront. But it's given, you know, the leaders having courage to um, enough courage to share and give an open platform a form where people can share their, strug their struggles, their abuse and be comfortable in, uh, in sharing where they have some peace about sharing. We had a workshop um, a couple of years ago where one of the young ladies actually realized at this workshop that she was sexually assaulted. And um, well in her adult, uh, in her forties, I believe, and where she finally realized that she was, that she had been assaulted. And so I think it's, it's begin to engage not only your members, um, the community in talking about these tough topics. And these are topics we don't wanna talk about, especially in the African-American community. We don't wanna talk about it because historically we wanted to keep it quiet. We didn't want anyone to know our business because if the neighborhood or the community knew our business, you were that family like, yeah, you don't wanna, you don't wanna hang out with that family because they got some bad people in their family. You don't want to mess with Uncle Johnny because you know Uncle Johnny. And so, um, but we grew up in an environment where we got to, we already have it tough as African Americans, but we got to maintain this image. And so I'm not going to share what's going on. And what has happened because of that, people have kept quiet, but have hurt over the years, years and years and years of people holding in what has happened. And as leaders in the faith based community, we need to begin to engage our members and give a platform where people can share, not just to attack the abuser, but share in an effort to begin healing and to say, it's okay that 
I was sexually assaulted or molested and it doesn't define who I am. I know who I am in Christ, um, but to be able to move forward. But I think starting there, you know, so we begin to break that, that stigma. I, I do appreciate the, the, the uh, not the millennials, but I guess the Gen Z generation where they're pushing that envelope where they're beginning to talk about these topics. They're beginning to share Whereas the Gen X, my generation, and the uh, the baby boomers, it was all hush hush, don't talk about it. And now you have this younger generation where they're coming out and they're pushing the envelope and they're beginning to talk about it. And so we need to begin to talk about it. And I think the more we talk about it, the more it's in the forefront of our minds and it's visible where we see it and we're um, having these discussions that um, the stigma of the secrets in the hood will be no more. And not only no more, people will feel okay to say, hey, this happened to me, but it doesn't define who I am. I applaud um, celebrities who talk about what has happened. They, they talk about depression, they talk about sexual assault, but the difference between celebrities and who I am, they're not tangible, so to speak. They're not right there, you know, but here we are, you know, talking to each other. We live in the same community. So um, they can talk about it. They have the platform to talk about it, but, you know, and they have the audience. And what we need to do in our own community is to have a similar platform and talk about it and say, hey, I know you. Wow. And I think for me, when I began to share um, in the church, you know, it opened up the door of opportunity to share in the community. But being okay um, that it happened and it, it gave me, I felt empowered to share my story because I knew someone else was hurting. And if it just touched one person to let them know that, hey, you're, you're not alone, then I did my job. But I, again, as I said before, is having these discussions in the church and being okay and not you know, feeling um, as though that you know, by sharing this particular topic, that you're doing something wrong uh, by talking about a tough subject. And I think it's because they may not be prepared. And that's why we have experts like you all, have experts like you all in that we, we reach out to experts that can assist. And then we provide those resources to women, uh, men, young boys, young girls, um, about the resources available to seek help. Because you don't want it to manifest like it did for me. This was years, 40 plus years. And so um, that I've dealt with this. And so if you can attack it when they're young, it will help them later in life because they, they dealt with it. They, um, they've worked through the, 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 the consequences of the actions uh, against them and they're able to live a more productive life. And so uh, for me, it was a challenge it, and it was, you know, but I thank God for, um, the platform that he's given me. And it's starting a church where I begin to say, hey, this is who I am and this is what happened. And so I think it will begin there. Well, again, thank you so much. We're gonna wrap this up. But um, what we want to um, stress is that this is not the end of this conversation. This is the last day of April, the last day of um, Sexual Assault Awareness Month, Domestic Violence Awareness Month is not until October but we don't have to be confined to those time frames to have this discussion because it is one that's necessary and ongoing. And as much as we can continue to collaborate and work with one another, we will have more opportunities to empower people to um, move from that place of crisis to that place of confidence and remove all negative stigma about this being their fault, whereas they're not to be um, framed around the shame that they may feel about what happened. Um, at the end of this, you will get information about our resources. Um, we, we have not closed our doors um, as a result of COVID-19. We've been even busier than ever. Um, we've created other ways in which we can interface with the clients, um, both our existing and our new clients. Um, we are proud to have a crisis line that one can text to because what we know about sheltering at home is that it's not necessarily a safe place for those who are victims of abuse and sexual assault. And so I'm proud of the work that we've done around that. Thank you for your courage. Um, thank you for finding yourself and you being found by Chris in that fetal position that you rose up from and um, using your 
your every platform available to you to share your story and to help others who have been negatively impacted. So thank you so much um, to our community. Thank you for your support. Thank you for um, your ongoing um, acknowledgement of our doors being open. Um, I'm always um, open to receiving calls, even if in the middle of the night. So I mean, you have called me before and said, hey, Cassandra, we got this going on. How can your agency help? And so we welcome every opportunity for you to reach out to us so that we can empower um, persons to be um, um, move from that victim status to that place of survivor and then um, live healthy, meaningful lives. Um, any closing remarks by you, Tony, on this before we shut it down? Um, once again, Thank you for uh, to Charmaine for sharing. Absolutely. And I think also that for uh, if there are people at home that are watching and feel like that they don't want to share their voice. I think one of the things that was so profound that Charmaine also said is that she wasn't looking for vengeance or revenge uh, against the person that perpetrated against her. She just wanted resolution and she wanted healing for herself. She forgave him so that she could move forward herself. And that's a really important point for us all to remember. Let's also for to remember for many children and many people that are going through this currently and may find themselves in the middle of the judicial system or even just talking to a family member or a friend and they feel like, I don't want to tell because I don't want to be responsible for what happens to him. That's not your burden to bear. Exactly. It's not your shame to bear about what someone has done to you that victimized you and it's not your responsibility to share the burden about the consequences of their own actions have on them. And I think in also we have to remember that we've had a lot of things in uh, the media in the last few years about celebrities that have received consequences for their behaviors. And I think we have to remember as a community to not take those things lightheartedly and to not joke about it because you may be making a joke that's really offensive to someone in your circle that has been impacted and it stops them from coming forward and telling their truth about what happened to them on their journey and prevent other people from healing. It makes that victim continue to carry the burden of it. And so we have to start by believing. If I would close anything I'd say, I say, if someone, I know we've had a lot of questions from the community saying, what do we do to support victims or people who are experiencing domestic violence or sexual assault? We have to start by believing, that's it. Very simply said, start by believing and not by blaming her and or him who has been victimized. That's just the start and that's pretty much the end. If we do those things, then we have created a space where people can heal from this journey. I thank you all for joining us and I thank mostly um, Charmaine for being there and really sharing her journey. It's been amazing. We appreciate it. Thank you for the opportunity. Yes, absolutely. Everyone be safe out there in this COVID-19 world we're living in. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> mm -hmm.